I want to talk to you on the subject that's sort of grandly titled Interpreting Failures and Conserving Victories. How do you interpret the failures that you face in life? And all of us do. Uh, somebody, my brother uh, in Canada, he's a medical doctor. He's a pain management specialist. And one day I said to him, all of life is pain management. How you deal with pain, how you deal with struggles, how you deal with losses, how you deal with disappointments, how you deal with your own failures and your shortcoming, uh, your shortcomings. In fact, I've just finished the latest book along with my colleague from Oxford, Vince Vitale. It's called, If God, Why Suffering? So we go through a lot of those. But then at the same time, when we enjoy successes, when we seem to think we've reached the mountaintop with a grand, ex grand moment of success or blessing or whatever, how do we put this all into context? One of the most profound chapters in the Bible is in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'd like to read for you from this chapter, and if you don't have your Bibles, I'll read it for you from the New International Version. The book of Deuteronomy is referred to by commentators, by biblical commentators, as the most favored book of Jesus because he quoted so often from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteron Deuteronomos, literally meaning the reiteration of the law as the law was given to them again. If the proliferation of usage is an indication of favored status, then chapter 8 must have been one of his most favored chapters of all because in his temptation or testing in the wilderness, all of his responses come from this chapter. That tells me how defining this chapter was <coughs> for the people of Israel and for your walk and my walk with God. If our Lord Jesus in the wilderness is being tested by the enemy of our souls and all of his responses come from this particular chapter, this had to be very germane in the biblical passage. Chapter 8, verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord has promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years. Why? To humble you and to test you in order to know that what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you, causing to hunger and then feeding you with manna which neither knew you nor your fathers had known. Why? To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. And he goes on to later on when he says in, in verse, uh, the latter part of verses 6 and so on, he says, Observe the commandments of your Lord, walking in his ways and revering him. The Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and you are satisfied, praise the Lord your God, for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe his commandments, his laws and decrees that I'm giving you this day. Father, I pray you will bless, minister, inspire, and help us to learn what it is you're trying to say so that we too may be wise in this day as we live and know how to go through the pain and suffering we sometimes have to go through and how to celebrate the triumphs which also so punctuate our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When you look at the Old Testament, many of the teachings come in threes. It is this, for example, the salvation was accomplished at the Exodus. Their identity was defined at Sinai, and their preservation was guaranteed through the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Their salvation 
accomplished in the Exodus, identity defined at Sinai, and then the righteousness and the path that they were to follow is shown in that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, how they would be preserved. They were to refresh their memories of God's saving grace at the feast of the Passover. They were to renew their commitments at the feast of Pentecost. They were respond to respond as a blessed community at the feast of Tabernacles. They were a redeemed community, a commanded community, and a blessed community. And yet things went wrong. Things went wrong because of the way leadership went wrong. Leadership is critical in the home, in the academy, in politics, in church, wherever it is. At the center of a column will always stand one person who has to lead, who has to blaze the trail. And if you read the history of Israel, you'll see where the failings came amongst the leadership. You see the untamed passions of a gifted man, wanton power in a privileged man, and the unteachable temperament of a man with a possessed promise. You see untamed passions in a gifted man, wanton power in a weak man, and the unteachable temperament in a privileged man. In Solomon, you saw all of that capacity never able to control his sensual inclinations. In Rehoboam, you saw all the power that suddenly came to him, but he was weak, unable to know how to handle genuine power. Jeroboam was given an extraordinary promise, a promise that he would be blessed like unto David, but he was not teachable. And he lost out. And if you look at leadership today, you'll see one of these three failings. You'll see the sensually driven, unable to handle power, with thinking they themselves are the beginning and the end of it all, and an unteachable person. This is where our failings really come. But as they were going in through the wilderness, Moses is leading them. He himself has had a tough time coming to this point of believing that he was called to do this. And the most fascinating and ironic thing about preparing Moses, to me at least, comes in the passage when after all of the miracles he'd seen, all of the empowerments given to him, all of that, he really said, how will I know that you've actually called me to do this? How do I know that? God gave him the most incredible answer, which probably caused Moses to say, that's really not what I was looking for. God said, when you get there, you will know I'm the one who brought you. <laughs> Say, that's not what I'm asking for, Lord. I want to know before I get there whether you really want me to get there. That's how the Grand Weaver works. The designing threads. You realize more and more how sometimes you blundered into the right. You had no intention to turn out to be looking so right in it all. And God brought you through. I look at my own life, born and raised in the city of Chennai in India, called Chennai long before the British came. They changed the name to Madras, and then when the spirit of nationalism arose, they harked back and changed Madras back to Chennai. In the early days when I used to go and visit the home where I was born and raised, when I'd take my wife, my wife's from Canada, I'd go or take friends there. If you'd put about three people with an outstretched span like that, that'd be as wide as the street was in where I lived, if maybe if three. And in that one tiny little room where seven of us would be raised, and it's okay, nothing to complain about, I'm just telling you, the Grand Weaver had a different story in mind for the years to come, for all that he was preparing one individual for, another individual for. And if you tonight are sitting here wondering, what does it take to get to the place of God's choosing? How do I get there? I promise you, if you honor the directions he is, has given, when you get there, you will be absolutely certain in your mind that if it weren't for him, you would never have made it through this terrain. I'll guarantee you that. And so what is it that God tells them he wants of them? You see, he was going to take them across this little over 100 plus miles. It should not have taken them more than six weeks to cross, maximum. 
40 years. You know, the old story is told of the Texan rancher who was talking to a Punjabi Indian in Punjab and he said to him, Mr. Singh, how big is your farm? And the Punjabi farmer says, you know, if you stand here and look straight ahead, you see that lamppost? That's how long it is and that's how wide it is. And the Texan said, do you know how big my ranch is back home? If I got into the car at six o'clock in the morning and drove and drove and drove several hours later, I still wouldn't have reached the end of my ranch. The Punjabi says, I know exactly what you mean. I used to have a car just like that. <laughs> We can brag about how big things are, how long it is. And here's God taking them through this terrain. Imagine in that rugged terrain with such a vast number, how annoying it must have become after some time to put up with all of the grumbling and all of the complaining. 40 years. Here's the first lesson I want to leave with you. The shortest route is not always the best route because it can bypass some of life's most important lessons. The shortest route is not always the best route because oftentimes it can bypass life's most important lessons. And he says, I took you through all of this wandering. Why? So that you would get to know what was in your heart. One of God's great designs in your life and mine is for us to look at our own hearts and understand who we really are on the inside. Not what people think we are. Not how it looks with the plasticity on the outside and all the makeup that we can have. Many years ago, in the year 2000, the former Soviet Union was releasing its political prisoners. And one of them was a Hungarian prisoner by the name of Andres Thomas. He had been incarcerated in the Soviet Union in 1945 when he was 20 years old and was released in the year 2000 when he was 75 years old. A lot of that time spent in solitary confinement. They basically almost devastated this man psychologically. When he was, when the prisons were being, it's a true story, when the prisons were being emptied, they were going to do away with this man because he was talking total gibberish. They thought he was a psychiatric basket case. And somebody else said, you know, don't do that. Why don't you bring a Hungarian psychiatrist and let him at least talk to this man and see if there is some hope. And so the psychiatrist spent a protracted period of time with Andres Thomas, came out and said, the man is not talking gibberish. This is an old Hungarian dialect. Give him to us. We will work with him. We will reshape his mind. We will get him back into society. And so the Soviets granted that. And so they put him in a wheelchair and the psychiatrist was wheeling him out. If you have never read the story, you will never guess what his first request was. As he's being wheeled out, he looks at the psychiatrist and says, can I have a mirror? I haven't seen my face in 55 years. Now you figure out, you're a strong, determined young man at the age of 20. And the next time you see your face, you're 75. Politics, ideologies, does these things to people. And he could only last a glimpse for no more than a second or two. When he held up that mirror, he burst into uncontrollable sobs and put the mirror face down. He couldn't, for the life of him, believe that this was the same man they'd picked up when he was 20. We get up every morning, put on our innocent forms of disfigurement, Look at the mirror, we like what we see, and then we go out. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Is there a mirror for the soul? Is there a reflection God intends for you and me so that we know what we are intended to look like? It was George MacDonald from whom C.S. Lewis borrowed this statement. You do not have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. 
You do not have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Is there a mirror for the soul? Here's the first lesson. I took you through that wilderness for all these years so that you could see in the humility of your own heart what you really are like. Humility. You know, uh, God alone knows how to humble us without humiliating us and to exalt us without flattering us. God alone knows how to humble us without humiliating us and how to exalt us without flattering us. So said the famed uh, Australian and New Zealand writer E.M. Blakelock many, many decades ago. It's a statement I remember reading in one of his tiny little books and writing it down. And here's the first lesson. God intends you and me to have a humble heart and a humble spirit. Do away with pride do away with arrogance. The difference between David and Saul was that David was a man of a humble heart. Saul was an arrogant man who always wanted to look good and powerful in front of the people. Humility. There are two ways to learn humility. Number one is this, to focus on the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, talking about Jesus, but made himself of no reputation and humbled himself, being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has exalted him and given to him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. If the very Son of God can go all the way down to the humiliation of the cross, showing us that he was a humble servant and walked with the ordinary, talked with the needy, found himself with the destitute and the poor and the widow and the fatherless, for whom he placed such value in life, so often he found himself with the common person. And the Bible says the common person heard him gladly. It was the power brokers that were really fighting him. Humility. You learn this emulating capacity by observing our very Lord and how he lived, how he walked, how he died. God also finally exalted him. Gave him a name above every name. So that's the best way. It's a tough way. I've seen people like that in my walk. I've seen the humble of heart, and every time I've been with people like that, I have walked away just overwhelmed by it all. Just this week, I think, uh, well, may, if it was not here, it was, we came here from Indianapolis, I think it would have been somewhere there. Somebody was talking to me about a man that I knew in Calcutta. His name was Mark Buntain. I have some special friends and colleagues from India here tonight as well. They all know who Mark Buntain was. He was known as Saint Mark of Calcutta. Thousands were fed by his congregation every day. One of the humblest human beings you could ever meet. When I was 19, preaching my first two or three sermons, he was sitting on the platform in his church and gave me the pulpit to preach. I was a nervous wreck standing in front of that people and preaching. It was the second or third time I had ever stood in front of an audience. And I'll never forget as I sat down and my whole body literally trembling, but I was glad it was over with. The saint of a man reached out and grabbed my hand and he said, that was anointed. Anyone who knows Mark Buntain, if you're in the audience, you'll know I have not exaggerated what I have just said to you. An extraordinary human being. And the hallmark of Mark Buntain, his humble heart, his humility. And I call upon you, whoever you are, no matter how successful, God wants you to humble yourself. And when you watch the person of Christ, that humility naturally comes. If you don't come to it that way, I'll tell you, he'll get you there one way or the other. And here's a terrifying statement from Thomas Aquinas. The first time I read this, I didn't like it. I'm not even sure I agreed with it. But the more I've read it, it is chillingly true. Listen to what he says. In order to overcome pride, God punishes certain people by allowing them to fall into sins of the flesh, 
which though they may actually be less grievous than pride, are outwardly more shameful. From this indeed the gravity of pride is made manifest, for just as a wise physician, in order to cure a worse disease, allows the patient to contract one that is less dangerous, so also the sin of pride is shown to be more grievous by the very fact that as a remedy, God allows men to fall into some other sins. Wow. Do you know what Aquinas is saying? If you don't deal with pride, he'll know how to bring you to that point of dealing with it. That which in culture may be atrocious, though in the eyes of God is actually less grievous than the sin of pride itself. He'll bring you to recognize the grieviousness of pride by, help, by allowing you to fall into something lesser where culturally you'll be seen for what your heart and my heart really is. You see this happen time and time again. I think that's why Billy Graham prays a prayer every morning. I heard him say this. Every morning I pray, Lord, please today let me not do that which has taken you, do that which will destroy that which has taken decades to build. Let me not do today to destroy that which has taken decades to build. Humility of heart and the humbleness of heart. One of my great heroes as a young theological student was John Wesley. I don't know how many of you have read John Wesley's life. He was not a gigantic personality. He fully stretched. He was five foot four. So not exactly a towering presence to walk up in front of an audience. Wesley traveled 250,000 miles by horseback preaching. He preached 40,000 sermons in his life. Compute that. When the famous Oswald J. Smith in Canada was celebrating his 80th year, Billy Graham came to Toronto to preach and talked about the fact that O.J. Smith had preached 12,000 sermons in his life. That's 12,000 in the day of television and radio. John Wesley, 40,000 in the day of horseback, the original version of the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> mount his horse, go and speak. Mount his horse, go and speak. 40,000 sermons, 250,000 miles, worked with 15 different languages, wrote 600 pieces of literature, some of them massive journals. At the age of 83, he was angry with his doctor because his doctor didn't let him preach more than 14 times a week. At the age of 86, in his journal, he writes, laziness is slowly creeping in. There's an increasing, tended <laughs> There's an increasing tendency to stay in bed after 5.30 in the morning. Now, I've consoled myself by saying he probably went to sleep at 4 in the afternoon. I don't know what, he, what time he went to bed. He was one of 19 children raised by Susanna Wesley. Susanna herself was one of 29. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want to buy their shoes. 19, 29. One day, Susanna looked at John and said this to him. And he said, Mother, how do you define sin? She said, Son, whatever weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, that to you, John Wesley, becomes sin, however good it is in itself. So he covers the two great continents, brings in this uh, great evangelical awakening. You go to his home in London. There's a monument at the back there, a tribute to him, and these words... Reader, if you feel constrained to praise the instrument, stop and give God the glory. <laughs> if you feel constrained to praise the instrument, stop and give God the glory. We have nothing extraordinary over anybody else just because you stand in front of an audience and proclaim it. We ultimately preach our last sermon and are called to give an accountability before God. Charles Wesley said, God buries his workmen, but his work will go on. You've been watching Let My People Think with Dr. Ravi Zacharias. We're grateful for your prayers and financial support. If you'd like to know more about this ministry or would like to donate to our efforts, you can call us at 1-800-448-6766 or visit us online at www.rzim.org. You can also stay connected to RZIM through Twitter and Facebook. 
Our mailing address is RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. The paradox of the stone is, is, is set forth as if it's a philosophical argument that basically, I think, just um, misunderstands the nature of the terms. If God is the greatest power of all, the highest of which nothing else greater can exist, then by definition, he is that. So there can be no stone big enough that he couldn't lift because that would be a contradiction. So it's to set up really a false contradiction. The paradox of the stone is actually a very old argument against God's existence. It comes from the medieval period when they were trying to understand what does omnipotence mean. Richard Swinburne, for example, a contemporary Christian philosopher, um, has defined omnipotence as God being able to do all things that are congruent with God's character, with God's nature. So God can't do something illogical. God can't do something that doesn't co cohere with God's nature. That's what omnipotence means. So that argument is really not an argument at all because it's really about understanding how omnipotence is defined. It's supposed to show that uh, there are contradictions in the attributes of, um, of God that you really, it doesn't really make sense to believe in a being who is all powerful. But that's a misunderstanding of what um, omnipotence means or even how logic works. That's, that's, it's like asking, can we have, um, what happens if you have a, an irresistible force, an, an immovable object when, they, when the two come together? Well, if you have one, you can have the other. So that, that's not, never going to happen, it's, it's, it's a logical contradiction. But that's not, not a limitation on God, it's, it's just how logic works. It's, it's a, a philosophical game that does not respond to the actual data of what the Bible says about God himself as being above and beyond anything that exists or ever have, has existed. In fact, the source of all existing things. So there is no stone, there's no power, and God will not do in the universe that which is logically contradictory. Couldn't create a stone that he couldn't lift. It's just, a, it's an impossibility. And so it's really a nonsensical question. It sounds good in a bar, but it actually does not describe any really existing things. Let My People Think is a listener-supported television ministry 